Let's have a word of prayer. We thank you, Father, that your presence is here already. I just want to yield myself to you and yield your people to you, that you yourself release your word in power, with clarity, with understanding, that we will not live here the same. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All I want to do today is to prepare you for the fasting that starts tomorrow. Amen. I'm going to talk about how to pray for evangelism. So beginning tomorrow morning, you know how to pray. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you some scriptures as prayer points as we pray for this revival, in, for this uh, crusade in July and for the rest of the year so you can pray for uh, souls. Um, so we just, it's very simple how to pray for evangelism. You know, prepare yourselves. Um, the first scripture I want us to use is in Psalm, Psalm 2, verse 8. Psalm 2, verse 8. Psalm 2, verse 8. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. Amen. Amen. God is telling his people that, ask me, and I will give you the nations. Which means the nations are for the taking. God wants to give us the nations. God wants to give us laurel. Hallelujah. But he wants us to ask him. Ask me, and I will give it to you. I'm ready to give it to you. God wants to give laurel to Agape, but we have to ask him. We have to pray specifically. And, and uh, I remember the testimony. Many years ago, me and a group of friends, there were about four of us who were Christians, and we went to a new school. You know, and the first day there, we sat and we talked about what we would do to work for God. And we held hands before we parted. And we made some declaration on that campus that we are claiming this campus for Christ. We were young. One of the biggest problems was something, I don't know if someone knows in Mosul. Anybody knows what that means? You guys are, yeah. School dance was all boys school. When the girls come there for the, for the dance, you know, uh, it gets very bad for some of the boys. I remember one young boy in the scripture you do, went to one of the dance centers. He came and asked us, am I handsome? And he said, why? He said, how come the girls like me like that? It's so difficult to say no to them. So you know what we did on that day? We decreed that the two years we'll be in that school, there will be no student dance. And it didn't happen. People said that we have prayed this and said they would do it. They tried that. It never happened. Amen. Do you know what a decree is? You see, a law must be debated and agreed on to be enacted. A decree, there is no debate. You shall decree a thing and it shall come to pass. So let's take this land. God says, ask him for laurel. Hallelujah. So we must specifically pray and say, God, give agape laurel. I remember when we came into this building, we had just here. This part didn't belong to us. And we came for one of our 5 a.m. Saturday prayer meetings. And I told all the intercessors, put your hand on this wall and say, we are expanding in that direction. Some of them were so zealous. They went to this one and said, no, don't go there. That one is a church. We don't have any issue with them. We want this part. And lo and behold, we purchased the next two units and we own that also. And in fact, for, 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 we are even landlords of some people there. Amen. Ask and I'll give it to you. Ask. Sometimes when I go to places, and I walk there. I say, Lord, you say, wherever my feet shall tread, you have given it unto me. Especially in the workplace. So I want to be favored here. I want to make a mark on this place. I just declare it to myself. And it happens for me. It's in your mouth. Ask. Hallelujah. So take this scripture. Psalm 2 verse 8. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possessions. So if God can give us the ends of the earth, then Laurel dear is small. Do you agree with me? How many of you are from Baltimore? Please stand up, let me see you. The Baltimore people, let me see you. I said stand up, don't raise your hand. Your pastor is standing. When you drive and you cross the, the tunnel into Baltimore, declare, Lord, give us Baltimore. Give us Hartford County. Give us Edgewood, hallelujah. That new building we have bought, yes, we have signed the legal documentation. But next time you step there, said, Lord, we are taking this whole community. Hallelujah. Ask and I will give it to you. 
Hallelujah. We don't just want to lock ourselves into a room and have a good time. We want to take the community for the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. So this is the kind of prayer that I want to pray. Now look at this. This is Psalm 2 verse 8, right? Let's go to verse 1 of Psalm 2. The question I want to ask is, what nations does God say we should ask him for? Please read verses 1 to 3 for me. Psalm 2 verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? Mm. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their car- cords from us. Amen. <laughs> in verse 8, he's saying, ask for me, I'll give you the nations. My question is, what nations? When you go to verse 1, he says, why do the nations rage? So we've been these nations that he say will give to us are nations that are raging against God. And the people plot a vain thing. They are nations that are plotting against God. Verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Hallelujah. So these are people who are plotting against God, who are against God. By God says, I'll give them to you. Are you following me? You see what God is saying here? And he says, they plot against the Lord and against his people, saying, verse 3, let us break their bones in pieces and cast away their cause from us. You know how these days, America seems like Christians are trying to control us. Amen. Uh, this is uh, Pride Month, right? So they want to break free. They want to do whatever they want to do. If I want to marry a man, I can marry a man. Who, are, who is God to tell me what to do with my life? But God is saying that. So they, they want to be free from the rule of God. But God is saying, these are the nations I want you to ask me for. So God is saying, don't ask me for something easy. Ask me for something difficult. The person in your life who is harassing you, who is always criticizing your faith, when you see them, you are trying to hide your children because maybe it's a man who is dressing like a woman. God says, ask me for that one. Ask me for something difficult. And see my power and see my greatness. So don't just, you know, say, hey, as for my neighborhood, there are people, they are dangerous, so... I think I shared a testimony with you here some time ago. When we went to Baltimore one time to do an open air crusade, downtown Baltimore, some of the sisters went to an area to speak to them. And one of the guys said, you church people, you shouldn't be coming here. He said, why? Then he showed them a gun. We are dealing drugs here. But they stood their grounds. Do you know that day there was one homeless person who came to sing? That guy is a pastor now. Amen. You see, because we didn't have a church there, so we sent them to local churches. And that man is a pastor now. Let's ask God for the most difficult people around us. Hallelujah. Uh, The person who every time you see, you see the blood of Jesus. (laughs) Ask God for that soul. The person in your family who you think is a witch wants to kill you, ask God for that soul. Let that person repent and come here to testify. Hallelujah. Not those you, who you think are good. These are nations that rage against God, that plot against God. And after he said, he said, I will give you the nations. When you ask God for something, don't fear. Are you hearing me? Because fear is the opposite of faith. And I don't want you to go out there, we are here, and say, I'm going to witness for the Lord. The first person you meet there speaks some profanity to you and say, hey, pastor, I don't want to deal with these people. They are too vile. Or the first person you see is snorting some cocaine. Hey, pastor, ask for this. I don't want to. Amen. One time I was going to a a beggar king in the drive-thru. And I knew I was speaking to a man. But when I got there, the hand gave me a phone. I saw some, uh, what do you call that thing? Nail polish. Look, the colored one. Right? And I'm like, is it a man or a woman? I had to take a good look. And then you go and see that. I say, hey, pastor, these people, we don't want to deal with them. No. Hallelujah. Ask me for the nations. And God is asking us to ask him for the difficult nations. Why? Let's look at verses 4 and... uh, What does verses 4 to 7 say? Psalm 2, verses 4 to 7. Please read this for me. Psalm 2, verses 4 to 7. Mm -hmm. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Mm -hmm. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Mm -hmm. 
Then he shall speak to them in his wrath mm -hmm. and distress them in his deep displeasure. Amen. Stop right there. So what God is saying is that, look, these people that you see, that you think are so difficult, they, 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 will, they will wipe out Christianity. God is sitting on his throne and he's laughing at them. Because he's the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Amen. He is seated in the heavens and the earth is his full stool. Those people cannot compare to God. I don't care how much money they have. I don't care how much political power they have. I don't care how much influence they have. Amen. Know the God who is with you. And don't be afraid. They will never be able to stop the gospel in America. Amen. Because God is on the throne. And he will remember his church. So when they rise up against us, he will stand up and he says, I will give the, you the nations. Hallelujah. There can be resistance. Daniel chapter 10, you know, all know the story of how Daniel was praying for 21 days. He set himself to fast. And the answer wasn't coming. Then the angel came and said that the day you started to pray, your answer was released. But then the prince of Persia fought against us and resisted us. There will be resistance, but you will break through. Because finally, after 21 days, the answer came. What if Daniel has stopped praying after 20 days? Some of you, you will go out, you will see results, but keep pushing. Hallelujah. Sometimes it takes years. There are times, times when you will sow, and there are places you go to just reap. So don't give up. Don't give up. I have seen people I have prayed for and witnessed to for years. And finally, they give themselves to Christ. And even me, I'm shocked, even though I was praying for them. And that is why you see that the Christian himself doesn't believe in his own prayer. Hallelujah. Every territory, if you read that scripture in Daniel 10, it says the print of Persia resisted them. When you go to, to, to Daniel chapter 10, verse 1, you see that they were in Persia. You get it? So every territory has a spirit ruler over it. And that spirit ruler will resist you when you try to take the gospel there. Are you hearing me? So if you don't encounter any resistance, <laughs> something is wrong. When you encounter any resistance, that's what you should expect. Laurel has princes of Laurel. They are principalities and powers. Amen. You may not know this, but some time ago I read something about Washington, D.C. When they were founding it, some Freemasons laid a foundation, poured oil and something on it. What do you think they were doing? They were inviting some spirits to take over the nation, over the, the city of Washington, D.C. And whoever founded Laurel, I don't know, maybe something may have been done. So there's a peculiar spirit here, but the children of God have come. Change is on the way. They will resist, but they will move because the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings is with us. Praise the Lord, somebody. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 29, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first bind the strong man, then he will plunder his house. We are going to bind the principalities and the princes of Laurel. Hallelujah. Then we will plunder and take souls from them. Your village, there is a principality there. If you don't know me, I know. I know. Amen. That there are principalities in my village. Because sometimes we pray. I have, I have prayed some prayers, and my sister has had a dream where they have told her that thing your brother came to do. He has really troubled us. I went with oil from Accra, stood on the grounds. Amen of my mother's house, and I poured it down, and I dispossessed them. Yes, I had the power, but I have to open my mouth and do it. Midnight, that's when I stood there and did that. My sister said, hey, what have you done? You have caused trouble. I said, what trouble? I had a dream. And they said, what your brother did, he has come to trouble us. Now we have nowhere to stay. May that be the portion of the spirits of Laurel. You see, there are people from Africa. When they come, they paint their face and they do all kinds of weird things. So you see, these are demons. Demons can also wear suits. They are here in Laurel. 
Praise the Lord. But the time has come. Agape is taking over. Amen. Amen. We will bind them and we will plunder their goods. And we will win their souls into the kingdom. I tell people that evangelism is not just trying to change somebody's mind. You know, like you meet somebody, the Dallas Cowboys fan, a Manchester United fan, uh, what? Barcelona fan, and you're trying to convince them that, you know, Messi is better than Ronaldo. And all. No, 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 no. It is a spiritual warfare. You are taking somebody from the kingdom of darkness and put, bring them to the kingdom of light. You are depopulating hell, and the devil hates it, and he will fight you. But I thank God that he's on our side. Christ has died for these souls. And God wants them to leave the dominion of darkness to come in the dominion of light. So we are going to pray. And we are going to bind spirits of laurel. Principalities of laurel must give way. Hallelujah. The next scripture I want us to pray is going to be Habakkuk 2 verse 14. Habakkuk 2 verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Amen. We are going to pray that laurel will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Your neighborhood, pray that this will happen. Because the knowledge of God brings light. They are in darkness. Most of the problems we are having in this world is because the devil has blinded mankind with we have blinded them so they cannot withhold, behold the, the light of God. Please uh, go to first, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, should shine on them. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So basically what he's saying here is that the problem of the world is that the gospel is veiled to them because their minds have been blinded by the gods of this age. A god of this age, which is a spirit, which is an idol. Are you getting it? So the guy is wearing a suit, talking intellectually, that no, there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, the gospel has to change. That was old. This one is new. There is a God that has blinded that person. That is why they are doing that. So when we pray that the knowledge of the Lord will come, God will bring them revelation. He will open their eyes. And then they will see that God is real. Hallelujah. And then they will give their lives to Christ. The word of God says that we are the light of the world. Amen. And what does light do? Light dispels darkness. But if somebody is blind, you can have all the light, they still won't see. Are you getting me? So we need to pray that the knowledge of the glory of God will be in laurel. And once that knowledge comes, people will say, wow. You know, most of us, when we're in the world, we thought we were doing fine. Until one day, like something hit us. I heard somebody sing a song, you know, about how their sins are forgiven on their way to heaven. say, whoa. What is he talking about? And it seemed like something had dropped out of my, some scales had fallen out of my eye, and I had to give my life to Christ. All my arguments were gone. And in my life, I have seen many people who argue, argue. We had a friend, we in high school together, and he said there was no God. He was just arguing. We, we didn't give him a nickname for that. We go to college the first year, all of a sudden, the guy says he wants to receive Christ. I'm like, huh? What happened? He said, Charlie, I was trying to resist the thing, but the more you guys spoke to me, the more I saw the truth. And I think I just have to yield. And he gave his life to Christ. Four years we were with him on campus. We we're all Christian, we we're worshiping and praising God. Amen. What happened? He saw the light. Hallelujah. So I pray that the glory of the Lord will cover laurel, even as the waters cover the seas. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah. We are the light of the world, and we must let our light shine before men. And what that means is that, you see, if we keep the light here in this sanctuary, the world will not see it. So apart from speaking the gospel, we need to go into the world and live to let them know that you are different. Amen. And I want to give a shout out to men of honor, Father's Day. 
You know, I was in Ghana. And I saw them doing all these good things, mowing people's lawn. And let me tell you one thing that happens. One of the photos I got included um, when those who went to uh, Mrs. Bonaparte's house. You know, when I looked at it, I was in the car with her brother. And I said, look at your sister. And he said, what is this? And he was so fascinated. Seeing a direction and others going to clean. And there will be more opportunities. Uh, we are talking of maybe reviving the D.C. Central Kitchen. You know, let's go there, you know, and serve the unbelievers. To let them see who are these people. Amen. Who are these people? And let us do more. And I believe that a church must connect to the community. A church is not meant to be inside. When we started after school program, and the second camp that was advertised, one of my goals was that you, you won't believe how many people bring their children to the summer camp into the after school program and say, I didn't know there was a church here. And then they see the impact we are making on their children and they come to my office when I'm here and thank me, Pastor, we thank you what you are doing in our children's life. They don't come here on Sunday. Amen. But they come in there and there's a lady helping their children with passion to do their homework. And some of them, one of them was telling me, when my children, when I came back from work normally, I have difficulty getting my children to leave the TV to do their homework. Now when they come, when I, get, I take them home, they don't want to work TV, they want to read a book because there's a competition as to who can read more books from the library. That is the light. Are you getting me? So we're going to get into the community. You see, I'm telling you how to pray, but a lot of times we must follow prayer with action. Amen. We must follow prayer with action. So we must go into the community. We must be nice to people so they're like, wow, these people are different. And when you ask, where do you go to church? Hallelujah. If, if, if you grew up in Ghana, the polyclinics, and if Felicia, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Those nurses in their green and white uniform, hey, when I'm, going to your, when I'm sick and I'm going to polyclinic, I'm scared. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not scared of the doctor. Of India. I'm scared of the nurses. They will mention your name incorrectly. If you don't hear and say yes, then they'll get on your Why didn't you hear me when I mispronounced your name? So when they go to a polyclinic at Adabraka, there's a gentleman there. Yeah, what can I do to help you? He's doing this. Like, ah, is this man out of place? People who work in the clinic are supposed to be very difficult and nasty. Oh, one thing I remember, one time I went to the polyclinic, and, and they tell us to take some shots. Come the following day. When I took one, I didn't go back. A year later, I went. The lady gave me the shot. <laughs> Is that fair? <laughs> but this gentleman, <laughs> and she told everybody, she was shouting, and you came, and we said, come on, you didn't take the shot. I'm going to give it to you, and you will see. I said, madam, this is private business. Everybody was looking at me and laughing at me. You know, but this gentleman, when I look at the way he went, I was like, what? Who, who is he? Is he out of place? Where did they bring him from? Because I'm not used to seeing that kind of attitude. One day I got there early, and the man was preaching. Before the polyclinic opened, he was preaching the word of God. I said, ah, he's a Christian. He's a Christian. It doesn't just show on Sunday when he goes to church. It doesn't just show before the clinic opens when he's preaching, but the way he treats his patients, it shows. We have one of our sisters here. I think she's a nurse. And Pastor Ernest was sharing with me that he went to do some job at the place where she worked. Everybody was saying, this lady, she's a wonderful person. May that be your testimony. Amen. That is how we show the world that we are Christians. Because sometimes you don't know who is there. Uh, the person might be a brother. And then you mistreat them. And then <laughs> you see them in church. Uh, I had a testimony of somebody who met one of a, a brother who was a preacher. And, and he said, I know you. You are from Ghana. I said, no, I'm not from Ghana. 
course, it was to some people.
As for me, I'm not cut out for that evangelism thing. Those who evangelize, when they get there, they will get rewards. Hallelujah. May you not be left out. That is why we hold what we call harvest events. This crusade we are going to hold is a harvest event. We want to reach out. Because we are believing that we have prayed for Laura. We'll pray this, 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 week, uh, this week. And we believe the Lord is going to touch people. So we want to bring them in and harvest them into the kingdom. Praise God. So be a part of it. If there are people you are praying for to come to know the Lord, invite them to come. One of the greatest tragedies that I see in the church today is that when we have events like this, believers get together to have a good time. Back to you concept, it's not really for us. It is for unbelievers to come to get to know the Lord. So, and sometimes, personally, if you know me, money is something I don't really talk about a lot. I don't ask for it. But one thing I don't do also, I don't put pressure on other, other churches to come to our programs. You know, go to go and give this pastor the flyers uh, to come. We are having uh, something here. They go to that church, they know the Lord. Why do I need them? I'm going to send in unbelievers. Are you getting me? That's why some I get so tired of this. Every day, program here, program here, program here, prophet here, then we all run and we go and listen. We run and we are still the same. We are still the same. Let's bring unbelievers to the house of God where they can be saved. That is why whenever I stand here to preach, I want to give an altar call. Let somebody brought an unbeliever. As for you, you go to heaven. So please, but give me the unbelievers. <laughs> Let me speak the gospel to them so they can find Christ. Amen. So please be a part of this event, Evangelism Blast. And one thing I've learned in life is that if you haven't tried something, you will never know you can do it. I, I saw Pastor Furi on video testify. I was thinking about following things, so <laughs> about how excited he was to have been a part of the evangelism. Hallelujah. If you're here and haven't tried it, please come. The young people testified. You will share the gospel with somebody and they will receive Christ. Good. Was that me? Yes, it's you because the Holy Spirit is with you. All you need to do is take a step of faith. And then in, let's go to Ephesians 6. We read 17 to 20. Ephesians 6 verses 17 to 20. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that the utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. Amen. In verse 19, Paul is telling the church in, Eph in Ephesus to pray for him that utterance may be given to him so that he open his mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. This is a prayer point I want you to note. First of all, the reason why I went back to verse 17 to start is that he's talking here about the armor of God, the Christian's armor. You need it for warfare. And verse 18 is trying to tell us that the cup of warfare is prayer. And that's what we are going to do this week. Then Paul is saying that the, the, the church must pray for all saints. Amen. They must pray for all saints. This is the end of verse 18. Which means every Christian is involved in warfare. So as we pray, let's pray for others. This is come too much. Me, me. I want my miracle. You want your miracle. So we come. Me, I want this. I'm praying for one. I'm praying for one. I'm praying for one. You're praying for one. We should pray for all saints. Amen. Because we are all one unit. When one hurts, we all hurt. Amen. So we need to pray for everyone. Then he says, he the apostle, writing to them says that, and pray for me also, so that God will grant me utterance, so that I can preach the word. Because you see, preaching the gospel is warfare. Amen. It's warfare. These days, I don't know, if you see YouTube, sometimes people will take a clip of a preacher and say he's a false prophet because he says something wrong. Can you imagine if somebody is preaching every week for even 30 minutes? Amen. Every Sunday, 30-minute sermon. How many minutes is that? 
Can you just have it on the likelihood that that person will say something they shouldn't say? Every preacher, there are times you preach and you watch your own video or you listen, say, I wish I hadn't said that. So even in preaching the word, the devil will try to confuse what you are saying so that your message will be distorted. That is why you need to pray for preachers. Evangelist is going to be preaching in the crusade. Pray for her. I travel with her sometimes on crusade. Every time she's going to preach, when she stands in the way she's speaking the English, and he, everything, before she goes there, a lot of times it comes for me to pray for her. She's a nervous wreck. And I like to go with her and pray for her and stand behind her because I know the enemy is attacking her and fighting her. Some of these pastors, sometimes they preach and they come to me. I said it's what is right. I said, don't worry about it. It's said and done. Put it behind you and move on. Are you getting me? So, preaching the gospel itself is warfare. So, please, pray for me, your pastor. That when I stand to deliver the word, I'll deliver it with accuracy. Amen. Whether I'm preaching here or not. That's why you need to pray for your leaders. And I appreciate the Thursday team. They always pray for me. And I need their prayers. When I went to Ghana, I, I, I was teaching, I mean, the, the whole month of May, twi- two, day, two days in a week, I was teaching on leadership. People are depending on me. Pray for me. Pray for evangelists when she goes out on crusade. Pray for your pastors, even as they stand here to teach you. Pray for the Thursday team. Amen. Because preaching itself is warfare. It's warfare. And that is what Paul is trying to say. So let us pray for utterance for the laborers that when the Lord sends them, they will do the right thing. Even when the teams go out to evangelize, I will pray for you. Because I know you can meet somebody and say the wrong thing. We to take them off. And what they will tell you, if you are not careful, you won't evangelize again. Because the enemy, even though God is with you, the enemy is also there trying to protect his territory. So let's pray. As we go out to evangelize, pray for one another. When you go out and you meet somebody, somebody is talking, you are standing back there, be praying for the person. That God will give them discernment. They should know what to say and how to react to certain things. The other one you meet and you are evangelizing them, they try to say something to provoke you. Amen. So let's cover ourselves with prayer before we go out to witness. Hallelujah. God, the devil wants to distort our message. And something very interesting. If you look at verse 20, Paul says, from an ambassador in chains, that in it I speak, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul, do you know he wrote this letter when he was in jail? He was in jail. But yes, he's not praying to be released from jail. He wants them to pray for him that even in the chains, in the jail, he will still preach. You see how important evangelism is? And you know something? If the devil had him put in jail, and he goes to the jail, and now he's witnessing to people, the devil will regret. He himself will make an appeal for them to release that man. Because the man is converting the whole jail. Are you hearing me? Sometimes the devil puts you in a corner, take the opportunity to evangelize, and share the gospel. He will hurry up and say, hey, let him go. Let her go. And he will free you. I like I liked Paul for this. And the last scripture I want to share is in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, I exhort first all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks may be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. Amen. Listen to this. I want to, you know, abridge what you read. You read read it nicely, okay? But let me say. Verse 1, he said, I therefore exhaust first of all that supplication, prayer, intercession, and giving time be made for who? All men. Why? Verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? So we must pray for all men, and of course, women too, 
here is gender neutral. So don't say that we are praying for men, not women. Hallelujah. So the women also need prayer. We must pray for all men to be saved because God does not want anybody to get lost. Think about it. So this, this week, as we fast and pray, everybody you know, pray for them by name that they will get saved. Hallelujah. Because God does not want anybody to get lost. And here, I'm going to push you. It is the will of God that even that person who you think is the devil's sister or the devil's assistant, it is God's will that that person should be saved. So pray for that person. The one you think is a witch who is haunting you. Every time you sleep, it's become a snake and is chasing you. That you are praying that they should die, 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 die. Change your prayer and say, get saved, 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 saved. Amen. That is what the scripture says. God's desire is that that person who is pestering you and mocking you, your faith and everything, is that they should be saved. So don't pray that they will die. Pray that they will get saved. And pray for them by name. Look, there are some unbelievers who are tormenting your life today. The only reason why they are still tormenting you is that you have not prayed for them to get saved yet. If you pray for them to get saved, they will get saved, then you have peace of mind. If you read that scripture, he said that we should pray for kings and so on, right? Because when we pray for them and they do the right thing, there is peace in the country. The politicians, they won't take bribe. They won't spend your tax money uselessly. So pray for them. You don't like the man, but pray. You don't like Trump, but pray for him. You don't like Biden, but pray for him. Amen. All men, all men. So please, you have placed a restriction on those you pray for. Change it and start to pray for all men because that is the will of God. Let me conclude with this. If it is God's will that all men should be saved, then if you are here today sitting under my voice and you are not saved, it is God's will that you should be saved. He knows you by name and he wants you to be saved. He is he's calling you to come to him because he wants to save you too. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter your past. That is why the blood of Christ was shed. Amen. We say redeem. He paid for your sins. He paid for my sins. I'm not standing here preaching to you because I'm a good man, but because I believed in Christ and he gave me another chance and he saved me and he transformed me. Sometimes I mean when they are praising me, oh, you're a good man. I said, you don't know me, oh. God had to have me born again. God, the way I was born the first time, it wasn't good. I was a mess. I had to be born again. So you to your problem is that the mess you are in is because of the way you were born. I was in the same problem. But God wants to give you a new life. He wants to give you a new life. He wants to save you. He wants to pay for your sins. He wants to transform you. And he transformed you from the inside. And he will make you a new person. Whatever your name is, your name is known in heaven. And Jesus wants to save you. Let's stand on our feet. Let's stand on our feet. If you're a believer, if you're a believer, tell God to give you the grace this week to pray for souls. You know where the Holy Spirit has touched you. You know where your conviction is. Just begin to pray. Begin to pray. Begin to call upon the Lord. If you have, you have not done the evangelism work, ask him to forgive you. Hallelujah. Some of you need to ask him to give you some people in your family, some souls in your family. You need to ask God that give them to me. The only reason you are not saved because you have not asked. But you are here, you have not given your life to him. The word of God is very clear that God desires that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That includes you. He knows you by name. And as I'm preaching to you, he's listening to you and he's probably looking at you and saying, I want you to, to get saved today. Do you want to give your life to Christ? Take a stop of faith and come here to me and let me pray with you. If you are here, you don't know him. Say, if God wants everybody to save, then he wants me to be saved. So I want to be saved today. Wherever you are standing, please raise your hand and I'll pray with you. Anybody here wants to give their life to Christ today? Obey, obey the voice of God. Obey the voice of God. He wants to save you. He died for you. 
He wants to save you and use you in his kingdom to build his kingdom. If you want to give your life to him, raise your hand. But if you are all believers here, let's begin to ask the Holy Spirit. The scripture says we know not how to pray, but the Spirit himself helps us to help us this week to pray, to pray for the lost. Yes, to pray for territory, to take laurel for the Lord. To take your family for the Lord. To take your workplace for the Lord. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. You are here. You have never even witnessed to anyone about Jesus Christ. Say, Lord, release me from this bondage of fear of evangelism. Guru Mashaka Bini Mandara Bara 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 Me not to gentle sing Yeah Yeah My humble cry While on others thou art calling Do not pass for your word we thank you for what you are doing in Agape Life Ministries this year we thank you for all those who have gone out to even evangelize Father as we are stepping into next week I pray Lord, that you release Holy Spirit you release a new spirit of prayer a new hunger and test oh Lord for evangelism upon this ministry and above all Lord I pray Lord give us laurel Give us laurel. Give us laurel. Your word declares that wherever we set the sole of our feet or you have given it to us. You planted us here. When we started, we were looking for a place. You gave us Cotton Hills Elementary School. We were looking for land. You gave it to us in laurel. We were looking for a building. You gave it to us in laurel. So now we ask for laurel. Because you don't just plant us here to occupy space. You planted us here to be a life. A light. Make agape a light Amen. and make our members lights. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.